This podcast is part of the Telerik Developer Network. Telerik, a progress company. Hello, and welcome to Eat Sleep Code, the official Telerik podcast. I'm your host, Ed Charbonneau, and with me today is Jen Luber. Hi, everybody. I'm Jen. And Michael Crump. Hey, everybody. I'm Michael. And today we're going to be talking about Weekend Warriors app development. Now, the three of us are part of the Telerik DevRel team, and we have our full-time gig, and we also do some app development uh, on the weekends, uh, and we have hobbies that are mainly driven by, you know, development and uh, making games, apps, you name it. Uh, Michael, why don't you fill us in a little bit about our day-to-day -day activities and then we'll get into our hobbies. So in a nutshell, we are a team of developers that educate and engage with the developer community. We do this with blog posts, webinars, screencasts, hackathons, and speaking at conferences. By engaging with developers, we are listening for feedback that we can bring back to the product teams to make our products even better. So Jen, um, I know you run a website called Ladies First Media, and you have several projects that you work on on the side. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those projects and you know what they do, what, what the main purpose of Ladies First Media is? I know you do a lot of stuff with uh, kids and family type of apps. Sure, yeah. Um, if you'd like to visit me online, um, I'm at Ladies First Media. That's L-A-D-E-E-Z, uh, First Media. And uh, I have a very sort of esoteric portfolio. It's pretty large at this point. I, I just counted uh, 18 iOS apps that I have in production. Um, and I also have um, apps, mobile apps on Nook, Kindle, and on the Google Play Store, kind of scattered all over the place. Um, my primary focus has been on ebooks, educational content, uh, fitness apps. Um, I really have a lot of fun making those sort of apps. Um, but within the fitness sector, I have a stretching app, I have a seven minute workout, I have a belly dancing app. Um, on the educational front, uh, I had a project that lasted the entire uh, entirety of last summer called the Snappy Squirrel Project. And it was about a little squirrel who's learning how to save his money. And I did this content with my dad, um, who was really great about personal finance. So we created a series of ebooks uh, to teach kids about personal finance. So these sort of like things that I think will help people, uh, maybe with their health, you know, answer questions they might have, uh, any sort of uh, productive content that I can produce, I'm always happy to put it out there. Um, so yeah, visit me online and uh, check out my stuff. So out of your projects, Jen, what's one of your favorites? Um. I'm actually starting a new project called Thing Learn, and this is not going to be mobile focused. It's going to be a web project, actually. So I'm doing something a little bit different for this coming summer, and it's uh, also features one of my passions, which is the Internet of Things. But it has the educational focus so that what I'm doing is creating content and curriculum that teachers can use in classrooms or clubs like coding clubs or Girl Scout troops or anybody could use to learn how to program by means of using Internet of Things devices. So um, I'm starting to have conversations with uh, Girl Scout councils. Maybe we could create a badge around this area. Uh, because I think learning about the Internet of Things is a great way to teach kids how to code because it's such a, it has such a physicality about it. Uh, so I'm going to be creating a lot of content this summer that's upcoming. Um, I also have another web project which I'm going to be converting to mobile, and that's um, called Quick Noms. And this is a content that I created for my kids who are admittedly uh, not the best cooks in the world. So the, this is the concept of five ingredient recipes, five ingredients and minimal prep time. And uh, you can create recipes, create, you know, healthy and nutritious meals out of with very little prep time and not much in the fridge so that my kids who go off to college will not starve. <laughs> so <laughs> Quick Noms is another, another kind of really fun project that I just keep kind of enhancing and adding to as people in the community give me their five ingredient recipes. So those are kind of two fun projects I'm working on. Now, Jen mentioned, um, you know, IoT and iOS, and I know, Michael, you've done some IoT. IoT stuff and some iOS apps. Um, you have uh, some fitness apps as well, don't you, Mike? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so in the Windows uh, Store, um, I've, I've created a treadmill assistant app. And it's funny is that you know you kind of think of the word treadmill assistant, and you're like, what? What exactly is that? And it was because a lot of the apps that I found that were already in the store were you know designed for a lot of people like RunKeeper, uh, people that were going to be running outside. When most of the time I'm actually running on a treadmill. Um, a, a lot of that's because I have a surf shelf that allows me to you know s stay on my computer and you know, still be able to you know do some work and stuff. So that one's actually in the uh, that's actually in the Windows Store as well as I have another app that, that did fairly well. I'm still actually making some money off of it, so I still count that as as, as something good. And that's uh, another one that was called Full Screen Browser. So that allowed you you know basically the uh, default browser on the Windows uh, phone. Uh, you know, it was small. Uh, this allowed you to use the full screen. You could add things like bookmarks and a couple of other uh, pieces to that. I also had um, with that as, as far as a couple of other kind of apps that I've been playing with, um, I've been very passionate around the wearable space. Um, so pretty much anything that's wearable, um, I try to uh, I try to play with. So everything from uh, the Microsoft Band, which I just got the Microsoft Band, and started digging in uh, slightly with the uh, SDK there. Um, I built apps for uh, Google Wear. Um, uh, right now, one that's that's currently it's open source. I've blogged about it on a, a Telerik Developer Network uh, that uses a speech recognition to calculate a tip. And I gave developers a couple of ways that they could expand on that and it's already been added to, to a couple of open source lists. And then also for Apple Watch. Uh, Apple Watch is another very, um, another very platform that I love playing with. And then I have from there, it's kind of an emoji dictionary. Uh, there's been a lot of times where I didn't know what emoji actually was, so it was, I thought it would be cool if I could actually, you know, use my watch and find the uh, find an emoji and then uh, select it, and then it tells me what the actual meaning is, so I don't look absolutely, you know, completely stupid uh, <laughs> before I actually include it include it somewhere. And you know, they keep adding emojis, especially on iOS. So um, it's one of those things that you know. These are just a couple of a uh, couple of projects that I've, I've been playing with in the, in my spare time. So the both of you, you have developed for lots of different platforms. So I'm sure this is going to be uh, quite a interesting question because it's going to bring up a lot of different uh, tools and resources. But what are some of the tools that you're using to develop these things? Um, Jen, I'm go ahead and kick this off with you uh, because you said something about eBooks. So uh, maybe give us a little insight as to what it takes to uh, build one of these eBooks. If there's any uh, scripting involved or anything like that. What are the tools that you use? Uh, is there coding? Um, mm -hmm. And then you know, we can talk about some of the other uh, apps as well. Sure. Um, so uh, for a long time, I was actually the Boston ambassador for uh, Corona SDK. So if you're not familiar with Corona, uh, it's it allows you to create cross-platform apps for um, iOS, Android, uh, Nook, and Kindle. And you're writing in Lua, which is a, a kind of easy to learn scripting language, and it's compiling down uh, to bytecode. So um, you're writing in this kind of simple to learn language, and then it compiles to run very, very quickly and efficiently on the various uh, devices. And it's particularly well suited for game development and ebook, anything that needs nice animation, smooth transitions, uh, and then the ability to run quickly. Uh, so, yeah, so there are templates out there, um, and easy ways to create these ebooks. Um, I have, I did all of my snappy ebooks as both an ebook and then there's a tab where you can play a game. So I wanted the kids to have fun while they're learning about personal finance, which can be kind of dry. So each one of the ebooks has at least one animation in there. So like there'll be a butterfly flying through the screen. Um, and then there's also a tab where you can play a game. So I have, um, I bought a template, uh, a, fl a flappy, uh, sorry, flappy bird template. I called it flappy snappy, <laughs> just reskinned it. <laughs> and so you can have snappy jumping through the trees and, you know, just a sort of uh, endless runner game. So you can either read the ebook or play the game all in the same app. And Corona SDK is particularly well suited to that kind of development. Um, I always say, you know, pick the right tool for the right job. So, you know, if you're creating 2D games, try Corona SDK. If you're tr doing 3D games, try Unity. Um, there's so much out there. May as well learn something new. Um, 
So for eBooks, um, that's a good solution. Uh, when you're using this language, what, what can you compare it to for those of us that haven't written anything in it? It, it, it always reminds me a little bit of Ruby. Uh, it's just a little bit similar to Ruby. So uh, very simple syntax. It's not the most powerful language in the world, but basically what, you're just using it to leverage the Corona uh, SDK AP, um, API anyway. So you're just calling into that, and then that's basically doing the heavy lifting for you. Now, Michael, what are some of the you know tools and languages you're using for your app? Yeah, so I primarily uh, write in native. So um, when it comes to, uh, you know, the Windows stores, um, obviously I'm going to be inside of Visual Studio. Uh, language of choice there is going to be C Sharp. Just love C Sharp. I still think that's one of my absolute favorite languages of all times. Uh, but then on the Android side, I started uh, with Eclipse. And, you know, obviously with um, Android, you're writing with Java and you're using XML for your, your user interface. And then I moved from there just as soon as Google, in, in, at Google O when they introduced uh, Android Studio. Um, Android Studio was uh, obviously, you know, uh, an IDE that's completely centered around building Android applications. So um, I've been using I've been using that for all of my all of my Android development, and then finally uh, Xcode. So my very first iOS app was completely uh, Objective C. Yes, I, I, I bit the bullet and learned that, and that was coming from a .NET space. Uh, so the Java transition, you know, from .NET to Java was 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 fairly easy. Uh, moving from .NET to Objective C was an absolute pain. I could never get the square brackets in, in the right place, you know, and, and all that other stuff. Just the format was crazy. So I, I wrote the first app, and I submitted it, and it was immediately rejected. So <laughs> there was there was something that I, I, I had done wrong. I can't even remember at this time. But anyway, I, I submitted it again, and uh, it was it was in the store. And then from there, um, obviously, I moved to Swift. Um, last year, I was at uh, Apple's uh, Worldwide Developer Conference and where they introduced Swift. So I started writing my first app with Swift, which was a very simple app. It was actually just called Task, and there is a million task applications if you look in the iOS store. But I wanted to learn the language. So as I, as I, was, build, as I, was, as I was writing this app out, I noticed that Swift kept changing. So there was a, there were several times where I would recompile and it wouldn't work after the latest Xcode update. So Xcode and Swift is the latest that I'm using for iOS and Android Studio for uh, my Android apps. Now, Michael mentioned, you know, getting rejected from the App Store. Genevieve ever had any apps get rejected? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it's especially with iOS because, well, Android now they're starting to do a little bit of reviewing as well, but iOS is notorious, and it the joke is it kind of depends on you know who you get that day and uh, who's looking and what they've been having for breakfast. It's completely it feels sometimes very random, but um, a great way to get your app rejected is keyword stuffing. So if you if you do something like you know list app for uh, you know awesome game and fabulous win prize, you know, things that have nothing to do with your app. Uh, that's going to get rejected. Another great way to get rejected is to um, ask people or incentivize people for uh, ratings and reviews. I had an app rejected because I said, review my app, and then I had an image of five stars. <laughs> and you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't even suggest that someone would give you a five-star review. You just ask politely and hope that the good things happen. <laughs> So lots of lots of good ways to get your app projected. I've seen them all. <laughs> uh, Michael, what app stores have you been uh, involved in getting into? And what you know, do you have any tips for people that are trying to? Get their yeah, stuff in so app stores? well, I've also been rejected as well, and believe it or not, I've actually been rejected in the Windows uh, Phone Store. Um, uh, so we're giving hope to new mobile developers here with all of these rejections. Um, I had a two-way communication um, where a, a user could actually send me the feedback. And uh, I could respond to the feedback inside of the app, and they would get it as a uh, notification. And um, the reason that that got rejected was that 
Um, you had to be at least 14 years or older in order to have two-way communication in a Windows app. This is something that I mm. definitely didn't know, so I didn't put a rating that was high enough for it. So um, anyway, it, it was you know it was one of those generic I think E ratings for everyone, and so uh, it was rejected. And then app on the Apple side of things, that one was that I had one that was rejected there as well and I believe I believe the reason that that one was rejected was that uh, it was crashing on a certain device and they gave me a log that I could look through and I don't remember but I made just a couple of tweaks to the code and all of a sudden they said oh it's working on this device and it was obviously some really you know an older device and I didn't really think they would be testing on that I thought they were only were really only testing on you know some of the latest or at least the last two generations so that's a couple of them that I've got so the, the tip I can kind of give people is that you know when you're before you submit the submit to the App Store look at the look at the guidelines I mean just just make sure that you've went, kind of went through that that little checklist uh, Windows is, is 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 pretty nice when it comes to the checklist because they have uh, they have they have different ways that you can check through and make sure that you know you you have hit what they're looking for but look at the guidelines for each one of those and just like Jen had mentioned uh, Google is now reviewing apps before it was kind of the wild west of the app store uh, but now um, they are they are looking at the applications they are getting into the app store still in a couple of hours but they are definitely taking a look at them I love your advice, Michael. Read, read the manual. Read the manual. Exactly. <laughs> Basically what you're telling people. Read it. Read it. Because I didn't. <laughs> or, 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 or I would have known better on, on a couple of rejections that I had. Yeah, it's really difficult because, um, like, sort of these esoteric stores like the, the Nobby. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Nobby, but it's a, a, a little Android tablet for kids. And uh, I have an app on that. And... It's not really hard to test on that kind of device. I don't have, you know, an Android tablet, so you're kind of at the mercy of those testers. And they're actually doing you a service. Same thing with Nook. I don't have a good Nook here that I can test my app on, uh, sadly enough. So, you know, you kind of, they're trying to help you, and they're trying to make the, the software good quality. So look at it as a all QA testing. <laughs> so getting into the App Store uh, sounds like it comes with some trial and error. Um, but you know, creating these apps and getting to the app store is a big learning curve on its own. So, uh, Michael, what type of learning resources did you go to to, to start learning how to develop these apps and uh, get them in the app store and whatnot? Sure. So for uh, Windows, I already had a quite a bit of a background in XAML. Um, so I didn't really have to do a whole lot there. There was some free uh, books that, that came out um, by Charles Petzold that were uh, regarding Windows Phone development, and you can still find most of those um, in the store today. So I really didn't have a lot of uh, ramping up to do there. Um, as far as uh, iOS goes, um, there is there's there's quite a few resources um, that's out there. Um, there's a couple of universities that have produced some great uh, some great uh, videos that you can download and you can watch and also Apple has released uh, you know two books on uh, the two books on Swift that will kind of help you get started also uh, YouTube I uh, found that YouTube has a lot of videos that are just kind of made by the community and you know people were able to jump in and, and start you know learning from that that's actually how I started learning uh, a lot of stuff uh, regarding uh, Google Wear, but some of the some of the some of the places and some of the things that I would suggest would be, you know, look at your look at your local community. Um, I, you know, when when I first went to Meetup. dot uh, com, and I started looking, you know, what was around me in my area, you know, within driving distance. You know, I'm usually willing to drive, you know, maybe you know sixty, eighty miles, maybe more, depending on what it is. But I found that there was, you know, there, you know, there was a ton of of just user groups and meetups and things that you could go to that was absolutely free. Um, not only would you learn a ton about it, but you may actually, you know, discover somebody that is, you know, willing, you know, to spend some time with you or they may say, hey, you know what, I'm building an app and, you know, I'd love to have, you know, a, you know, a partner on it. So, I mean, there's, there's tons of opportunities there, events, you know, you know, going to events, just networking, you know, 
you know, don't kind of be that, you know, that person that kind of just sits in the corner and is quiet the whole time. You know, talk to, you know, talk to other developers. You know, most most developers are kind of shy at first, but uh, you know, once you get to talking to them and you find you know some common ground there, um, I found most most everybody is is willing to kind of you know share what they've learned. And, uh, and and the relationship can continue regardless of what state you live in. You know, we have Twitter, we have, you know, all of these Skype and all of these different tools that's out there that's available for us. I actually still keep in contact with, you know, several people that I met at uh, Apple's conference uh, last year. So yeah, anybody the, that's listened to the show here. before knows that I'm a big advocate of meetup groups and, you know, getting out there and networking and learning through other people. Um, and uh, Jen, you've got a lot of apps that do teaching as well, you know, teaching kids and things. Um, can you give us any advice on how to get kids involved in app development? And you know, are there any meetups or anything that, in your area that cater to kids and how to teaching them how to code? Yeah, just to back up a couple steps, um, I have a completely different perspective because I don't have a degree in software engineering, so I. Um, I just always have to just mention that my whole career path is basically if I can do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> so just to give you some kind of encouragement and advice, um, just I, I kind of sp subscribe to the Nike school, you know, just do it. Just think of something you'd like to build and then just try, just see how far you can get. And like Michael said, there are just a ton of user groups and resources out there. Um, Sometimes this can be a little challenging if you're young or if you're a minority or if you're a woman, um, but there are specifically great groups out there nowadays that are really trying to help um, diversify the field. So I would just encourage you to take a look at Girl Develop It, Girls Who Code. There's a group called Black Girls Code. Um, scouting is actually, I mentioned before, I'm a big fan of scouting. Um, there are badges, you know, that you know, to teach teach kids how to code, there are certainly merit badges um, that you can work towards. Um, but there are a lot of resources for kids online nowadays. Um, there's a lot of kids start with Scratch, which is an MIT project. Uh, they have also launched Scratch Junior, which is almost like pre pre typing, pre verbal. You're just dragging and dropping blocks of code to learn, you know, the logic of software development. Um, there's a just a lot of great stuff coming out of MIT. I encourage you to go look at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, their lifelong kindergarten program has some incredible projects going on right now that have actually inspired me in my work with Internet of Things. So, yeah, there's the sky's the limit for minorities, women, and kids. Just get out there, look what's around, and just do it. And Jen, you're actually doing something with your daughter at conferences now, aren't you? Yes, my daughter Stella and I um, are going to be team teaching uh, the world's first Mommy and Me circuit uh, workshops, so Mommy and Me programming workshop uh, at that conference in Wisconsin. So I, I'd love to have a big group of people working with me, um, mom and kids or just kids, anybody who wants to come and make uh, paper uh crafts with the uh, circuits. These are things that are going to light up. I just made the prototype last night. It's pretty incredible and so much fun to work with uh, sticky circuits. And I got this idea from the Lifelong Kindergarten Group at MIT. Uh, just uh, a really great way to learn about how circuits work and have fun doing it and create something that you can take home with you and show your friends. So I guess that's a, a good way to start talking about, um, you know, these weekend projects and how, how they affect family life, how you can work these things into uh, your family so it's not taking up, you know, good family time where you're supposed to be, you know, going to uh, school events and things like that, uh, where you can actually take your kid to a conference and, you know, make them part of a learning experience. It, uh, it helps involve the family. So do you have any other advice on, you know, that work family balance type of thing? I mean, that's a huge challenge. I've always maintained that um, all software corporations should give us a uh, a budget for under-eye concealer because, you know, we work so many late nights. I work a lot of late nights. I burn a lot of midnight oil, you know, coding until 2. And, uh, you know, it would be really great to look decent the next day, but, oh, well, you do what you can. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think it's really important, especially for people who work from home like we do, um, to get away from that screen get the kids away from that screen and go outside, you know, and just make sure that you are maintaining your work-life balance. But uh, sometimes your software projects can feed into your work-life balance, like QuickNoms has gotten us, you know, from the code 
to the screen and into the kitchen, you know, so the kids can see me, you know, working on these recipes and uploading them. Um, it's actually a static site. So I learned how to, how to do static sites with, with this web project. Um, and they can help me, you know, kind of test and, uh, we make videos for each recipe. So, you know, they've been working with me on kind of protecting, per perfecting that process. And one thing parents are going to find as the kids get older is you can learn a lot from your kids. Um, my daughter Stella taught me how to make vines, uh, you know, these sort of little, you know, the little things that they're so into. And I, I personally don't understand Snapchat, but she has convinced me that, you know, this is something that needs to be understood and leveraged. So um, always, yeah, just make sure to keep in touch with your kids about what's going on, because sometimes they're actually much more up to date than you are. Yeah, they always have a way of having their finger on the pulse of what's cool. That's and what's right. Not. We lose that when we get older for some reason. <laughs> Uh, Michael, same, same thing. Um, I know you guys, uh, both do a lot of fitness apps. Um, you know, fitness fits a lot into the work life balance thing. Did, did you start your treadmill app because it gave you time to, you know, exercise while you worked on something on the side? Yeah, so I started that app uh, primarily because, um, believe it or not, it's so funny is that um, I, w I was just talking to one of our coworkers about this, uh, about a blog post that, that, I'd, that, that I'd just published on one of my personal sites. And I told him that I wrote the whole thing um, actually on my treadmill. I was like four miles <laughs> per hour with zero incline with my surf shelf. I, you know, I wrote, a, I wrote a whole blog post, and it was one that, that did you know, pretty well, and I was kind of surprised, but yeah, it was one of those things that, you know, I, I, I just found, you know, hey, this, this is a, this, this application is, um, is something that I needed, and also I was able to, uh, I was able to tie in, you know, parts of, of, of what I'm doing here, you know, at Telerik as well, because I was able to use some of, some of the controls that we were, were currently, uh, you know, selling as well, so I was able to, you know, build an app that's going to, you know, going to finally, you know, help me. It's going to get to the store, but also I'm getting to kind of use more of our products and understand our products better. Where when I'm at that booth or wherever I'm at and uh, somebody comes up to me and, you know, they're talking to me about a control and they're like, well, can't do this or, you know, is, is, is this possible? I can give them some, you know, real world experience. Yes, I've actually used it in an app. And if you'd like to see it in, in an app outside of a sample app or something like that, then you can just download this one. Right now, um, I, every app I, that, that I have, you know, in the stores, I don't think I have, I'm not selling anything right now. Um, I've just been using ads. So anybody is able to download it for free. Yeah, I think that brings up another good point where uh, these side projects end up helping you in your day job. Now, for us as uh, you know, part of the DevRel team, uh, being in you know the developer advocate role, uh, it's a little different than uh, maybe if you're a programmer um, that's doing software development for a large company or enterprise. But you'd be surprised at what little things you find in these side projects that relate back to, you know, doing those kind of development um, objectives, too. So I'm kind of new to the DevRel team, so I remember, uh, you know, doing side projects, uh, working with stuff like responsive web design and then going back to work and having, like, these brand new ideas to share with the team and uh, get us off on a new path on, you know, some of the newer technologies that are out there. Uh, Jen, how about you? Uh, what type of stuff do you find working on your side projects that you can bring back to work? Actually, um, just to mention that side projects have become a critical part of the interview process. <laughs> In my last job, I was point blank asked, you know, what are your side projects? And I know for sure that my big mobile app portfolio help, helped kind of, you know, prove the point for this job that, you know, I do know what I'm doing with, <laughs> with developing and producing um, customer facing mobile apps. Um, I think that side projects especially if you're working in a in a corporation, allow you to keep up to date with technology that you may not have access to do, you know, in your regular day job. So, you know, you may not use it right now in your day job, but, you know, if you want to, for example, do a prototype of like Meteor, which is a fun, you know, a great way to produce, you know, web to mobile content, um, 
maybe you can show your corporation, you know, when the use case comes up, show them what you've done. And maybe, you know, this will help your, um, your corporation move, you know, move their tech forward. I think it's a great way to kind of just move the, move the, um, the needle, as you could say, uh, forward so te technologically. Jen's advice is this lets you play with toys your boss won't let you play with. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and another thing that was interesting is that people are starting to get so frustrated with, with the interview process. I actually read an article saying that uh, if you're asked to whiteboard code, which everyone hates to do in interviews, just say no and just go to your GitHub side projects and just talk through that. It's a much, much, much more effective way for uh, people who are trying to hire tech talent and people who are tech talent looking for jobs to showcase what, you know, what they're working on and what actually uh, is production ready and, uh, and the programming decisions that went into producing that software. Great way to, to keep up to date, to learn, and to prove your valor and your worth. Yeah, building a portfolio and having side projects as part of that portfolio is a huge part of personal branding and uh, we'll be covering that in a future show um, to give everybody some great advice about how to do that effectively so michael i know you've got a lot of your projects up on github um, can you tell us a little bit about how github uh, helps you with your side projects and uh, building you know your personal brand and things like that yeah so I found that um, so if you if you go to my my github account um, so what I, I typically do with with all of the apps that are in the app store is that uh, I'll publish the full source code because I really want other developers to come in and to either you know look at the code and say you know hey you know this you know I may want to do something with this. This is kind of my starting point. They may have never ever touched native app development before, um, but then you know, I also um, I also like to include a link to the app where it's it's actually in the store, so they can they, they can go ahead and download the app and say, okay, well this one actually pass certifications because you know we've all seen you know a million different sample applications that 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 would never make it you know into the actual store, but I like to put a link to the the app to the app store. Um, as well, you know, in there where they they can they can take it and they really they can do what they they want to with it. Um, like the last couple of apps that that I've wrote, um, there's been you know like I said, there's been no real monetization. I was really doing them to to learn from them, you know, kind of back to that weekend warrior uh, type of thing. But people enjoy that, and from that, I've had emails because on GitHub, that's the only place that I actually publish my personal email address. And so um, I will get emails, and from those emails, it will be like, okay, hey, you know, I saw your app doing this. Um, you know, uh, would you be interested in, you know, working on an app for us as well? So I mean, it kind of leads, it kind of leads you into other type of, of jobs or opportunities if you were interested in, you know, in, in doing such a thing. I believe that GitHub is just absolutely, you know, critical, especially when it comes to, to to jobs you know, nowadays you know it's it's what what project have have you been working on what 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 have what have you done you know lately especially when it comes you know involved in involving you know development in and software development people uh, you know people the hiring managers they're interested in learning you know what you what you've done lately um, I, I know we've always been interested, you know, at that here at Telerik, you know, what what they what people have been involved with, and everybody's been involved with some really cool open source projects. Sorry, that's the one uh, piece of advice that it, when a young programmer asks me, you know, how do I get into the field, I just say, you know, get that GitHub repository up running and get it stacked with really good stuff because that's what people are looking for. Yeah, I think everybody on the DevRel team will agree that GitHub is a huge part of uh, our jobs, and uh, you know, being part of that developer community is getting your code up and sharing it with the rest of the community to learn from and extend upon and make new things, be inspired. Um, Jen, Michael, I want to thank you guys for being part of the show today. Uh, you can find blog posts and articles from all three of us at developer.teller.com and we'll put show notes up on the website as well thank you guys thanks very much thanks for having me